Today we have Auntie Henrietta and um, Osaid doing some Quranic recitation. The format of today, as well as the next three weeks, will be a 25 minute reminder, and then we'll have 15 minutes of recitation after that. Okay, so if we start, we have Auntie Henrietta Savati, who, which is, who is a leadership coach, as well as the author of Heart Smart. She is a co-founder of the Barefoot Institute, um, the Muslim relationship organization that helps build confident Muslim families. She has worked with EU organizations, trained minority women in leadership and coached over 1,500 hours, helping people to unlock their true potential. So if I can just hand over to you, Auntie. Thank you, Samaya. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, I still find it a little, a little bit strange when some of you call me auntie and, and I, I have known you for so long. Um, so it just shows my age and I always get a little bit flustered with that because I'm, I'm still not used to the idea, I guess. I hope, you know, I, I will get used to the idea at some point. Um, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Um, so today I wanted to start um, the circle with a with a short reminder about the egos and um, I guess I don't know if it was an intentional choice um, from from Sarah who very kindly asked me to, to do the reminder and I picked the topic um, our ego in Islam and how to train our egos and I'm just going to show you a couple of slides um, so and, and, I, and I guess it was a intentional and, and maybe a subconscious choice, but it was, it was probably the right choice for me because I am notoriously a struggler um, in Ramadan when it comes to fasting. And some of you who know me, I didn't grow up with training myself to fast. My first ever first fast happened when I was 26. So of course um, I didn't have the practice from from a young age to understand the spiritual aspect of fasting but i was always very very drawn to the spiritual aspect of um islam and this is part of my work as well that what i do um when i have my muslim clients and and the the whole topic of topic of topic of ego is is really quite important for all of us to to understand because we hear some of the words like ruh and we try to make sense of it. So I, I thought it's it's a really good idea to, to perhaps start the um, thinking about what ego means to us because what we hear all the time in Ramadan is that we are supposed to be taming our ego with the fasting and overcoming the ego and a lot of associations with that. So. Um, it's very, very close to my heart, personally and professionally, but I think we need to think about them intelligently, uh, smartly, if we really want to understand and make the best of Ramadan, um, inshallah, for all of us. So, um, as I said, um, there are a couple of concepts that you have already s have seen and heard, and you, you probably know all of them uh, by heart, but I wanted to put them somehow together and also wanted to give you um, a psychological underpinning of what happens with these things in our practical life and, and how we go about our um, fasting. So ruh, nafs and soul that is often mentioned. So how does even ego fit into that? And we will look at that today. But I wanted to bring um, one verse, which is a very beautiful uh, verse from the Quran uh, in Surah 7, Ayah 205, which says, وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ فِي نَفْسِكَ and this is, um, in, in a sense, it, it encapsulates what nafs and what the self means, which is there are, there are a lot of elements to it and there are a lot of angles um, which we can refer to. So this, first of all, indicates a sense of self. This is the sense of our own self of who we are as a thinking, walking, talking um, entity. But nafs is also referring to particularly to specific parts of ourself that has desires and appetite and good and bad and the combination of, of both. So it has um, the elements of the ego. Now, the, the question of ego is, is really interesting here because I don't know if you remember, but when you were two or three, um, you some children earlier than two or three, we start to develop a certain kind of will, 
and a certain kind of um, attitude towards our parents, which means um, I know how to do things. And I remember my daughter when she was about one and a half, she want, I wanted her to walk up the stairs with me and she looked at me and she said, I do it by myself. So when we are children, we start developing a sense of will and uh, a sense of ego in a sense that we know what we want, we know how to do it, and we have power over something or somebody else. I have power over walking up the stairs because I can do it without help. I have power over my parents later on because I can overpower them. So that, that becomes uh, part of our ego. Now, the um, idea of NAPS and how it comes in, um, it's, it's very beautiful actually. And I wanted to refer, refer to the three types of NAPS. And we will go through each of them and I will give you a, a little bit of um, explanation for each. And what I'm asking you to reflect on is that in what circumstances you recognize yourself um, in relation to these concepts, because um, of course, what is really important about learning is that how do we put it into practice? And there is no better time than Ramadan to do that. So the first type of nafs that, that we, we talk about is the nafsul um, amara, which is in Surah 12, Ayah 53. Indeed, the nafs that overwhelmingly commands a person to do sin. Now, this is the, the nafs that is ruling over. And this means that the nafs is commanding us to do certain things because it has desires, it has wishes, it has an appetite, and it simply dominates um, our thinking. And this is a part of us um, also, if you look at from a psychological uh, point of view, is a part of us that wants to be uh, better than other people. It wants to tell people off. It wants to throw angry words. It's, 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 you know, it builds up to actually come to a level of committing sin if you talk about the conventional um, understanding of what sin is. Um, and it's, almost like it's a sovereign over us. It's something that we have a, as part of us, but it's not entirely of who we are, but it, it's almost an inclination of, you know, do this. And, and we, we have this in Ramadan quite a lot, I guess, because um, this is a part of ourselves that is, that is telling us, you know, you, don't need, you can break your fast or, or you can just, you know, do things in a different way, or you don't have to follow a particular timing. You know, all those things come into place uh, because it's uh, something that is dictating us instead of us dictating it. Now, this also comes out quite very, very often um, when it comes to emotions, but I will talk about that in a little while. So the Nafsul Amara is, is the, the type of nafs that is quite willing and quite happy to sin. And it goes blatantly and remorsely in any way it wants. So as you can see, there's very, very little control of our better self. And that better self, that best self would be our fitra and our ruh, which has been, which is breathed into every single person before we are born. So the essential divine spirit and the divine goodness that is breathed into us uh, then can go either way because when the ego takes over, then we it becomes a nafsur, um, nafsul amara. Now the second type of nafs is a nafsul lawama, which is you can find a reference for this in Surah 75, Ayah number two, which says, "And I swear by the reproaching soul to the certainty of resurrection." It is so important and so essential and so central to to our faith and practices and believe that uh, uh, Allah swears by it. So, and I swear by the reproaching soul. Now, this second type of nafs um, is, so lawam means to self-incriminate. It is the self-reproach, it's to have a blame, and it's, it's the feeling of and the concept that when we do something, we start feeling guilty. So there is that sense of, I shouldn't have done this, and um, it's a sign that actually we have a consciousness that we are practicing. So it's, it's really the idea when we start um, uh, feeling the remorse either for ourselves, so something that we have done or something that is happening to us. So this is, this is what the Lawama does. And um, the third type of nafs, which is the nafs al-mutmainna, and again, 
Uh, I put the reference here for you. It's uh, Surah 89, Ayah 27, 28, which says, To the righteous it will be said, all reassured soul, return to your Lord, well pleased and pleasing to him. Now, this, this has actually has two aspects, which I, I need to highlight. One aspect is that the mutmainna has two different meanings. One is, one meaning of that is that when we are content with Allah's decree, Allah's wisdom, and we know from our own life that um, it's much easier said than done. And we also know that it's much, um, uh, it's one thing to know it theoretically, but it's another thing to accept. And I think this is where the, how we work with our own soul during Ramadan is really important that we are becoming even more conscious about this work that we need to do with ourselves. Because to arrive to this level of nafsal mutmainna, which means to be content with, with the, what Allah has decreed. Um, so, so the two, the, the one aspect is of, of mutmainna is to accept and be content with Allah has decreed for us. And of course, this takes work in its own. Uh, it's one thing, as I said, to understand theoretically um, that you know this is good for me, and I need I need to be happy with Allah's decrees. And this is particularly important when when things happen to us that we don't don't expect and things that are just kind of thrown at us and things that and sometimes ramadan can feel a little bit like this it's suddenly you know we find ourselves at a time when we thought we were prepared but we were not and the first day of fast comes and of course all this internal struggle um comes in but with other things life just throws things at us and suddenly we don't know what to do now it's one thing to understand that it is good for me in the long run but it's quite another thing to actually practice it and come from that place of surrendering which is the second aspect of the um uh, mutmainna, which means is that the soul or our soul reaches a level of serenity and i and i guess this content contented serene tranquil at peace nafs or soul is is really what um the fasting is supposed to do to us and of course we all go through our own cycles of how we do the fast and how we struggle with that but that level of serenity is is really um, what we are after, and and of course it's not just Ramadan that we do that. Um, you know, this is supposed to be all our practices, outward and inward practices that we do. So whether it's the actual prayer that we do, that is helping us to go through the three levels of the nafs, um, or the bigger practices like um, going for for Hajj, um, whenever that becomes possible again. Um, and anything else that we do, the, the remembrance of Allah and the zikr that we do is all to do with the consciousness of our soul. Now, I say this because I think often we find ourselves that in certain situations we are very content and we, we find ourselves at the level of uh, mutmainna. But other times, and I think majority of the times, it's the first or second level where we are really struggling. We are trying to make sense of what's happening to us and and trying to to clarify um, where we stand and how do we accept the things for example which just come out of the blue and and we need to um, act on those things um, i br uh, brought a few thoughts um for this to to help us all uh, reflect and understand this so so the there's something that I, I have been working on, on recently, which is called spiritual intelligence and positive intelligence. And it's really is, is what we were talking about today is that that level of consciousness and level of understanding of who we are as people um, spiritually. And the purpose of life uh, is to gain access and closeness to this practice. So so Allah had had a reason for us to have his divine spirit breathed into every one of us. So we have a spark. Uh, within us but as we grow up we get conditioned away from that in divine goodness uh, th that fitra that disposition that that all children have and if you watch children you will you will notice that children often um you know they do things out of out of um an inclination and they don't give up because they truly believe that you know for example when they learn how to walk they don't just give up learning how to walk they keep walking and they keep practicing because deep down they believe that that's what they were designed for and therefore they recognize that they have got two legs so that essential goodness that has been given to every single person 
is slowly, slowly erodes and it gets conditioned. Often it's, it's consciously conditioned out of us. Often it's just what happens to us. We make sense of things and we create a, a, a world in our head, which may or may not be the truth, but we move away from that divine spirit. And what we call it um, in my profession, we call it the sage. And as probably you recognize it, it's in Sufi practices. It, it's that sage element of, of always, always knowing the right thing to say, the, how to feel, how to be at peace with everything, how to be open to the divine degree, and that high level of um, consciousness. And it takes, uh, it takes practice. Now, the self, uh, that self knows right and wrong by nature. So this is where kind of, kind of morality comes in that by, by that self, by that really a highly developed self, we know what is right and wrong. But again, you know, we get conditioned out of this because we are surrounded by certain people, certain ideologies, certain thoughts, certain energies, certain groups, certain ideas, and, and, and we slowly lose that capacity. But when we have that capacity, there is a real equilibrium of heart, mind, and soul, because these three always work together. And that consciousness that comes is actually that mindfulness, which is which is what we find in the, uh, the practices of zikr. This is the mindfulness in in this in the way of kushu when we pray, um, and these are all very practical steps that we can actually take um, during the month and outside of Ramadan, hopefully, inshallah. And we can train ourselves to become much more mindful and and more conscious of our actions, our words, and also conscious of our state of our, our soul. Now, how fasting is actually quite helpful, and this is what really helps me um, very often when I, when I lose my way, is that it actually strips us off from the nafs-driven actions. It, 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 the thoughts and the life that we leave, um, live outside of, of Ramadan is, is a very good pointer for us to see where, where our mind goes is where we are attached to the world instead of focusing on what is important for the soul. And I, and, and I have this um, habit uh, myself, I always remind myself in Ramadan, is that I'm starving my body to nurture my soul because that emptiness that the fasting creates is actually an opportunity to look at where is my nerves? What am I struggling with? What am I, what, what are my real, um, demons in my head about you know i have i have loads uh, i have anger i have impatience i have i've loads a whole lot of things but once you starve the body that creates a certain emptiness that allows you to look at your spirit and say well what is actually the work that i need to do now that I, i'm not busy with food and i'm not numbing myself with work my attention is not on anything else except the, the spiritual work that I, I need to do within uh, within myself. Um, and working on our nafs is actually a, a lifelong project, I believe. It's it's fasting is only a way um, to to chisel our ego into into a better shape, inshallah. So as you can see that the ruh and the nafs um, is is part of something they are part of each other, but um, what is important to understand is that the, the foundation of it all is that we all have the divine spirit breathed into us. Now, how we work with that, how much of our ego is allowed to take over, that is going to determine what level of nafs we can develop for ourselves. So um, the, the problem with, with ego is when we say that we want to curb the ego or overcome the ego, it's, it's literally impossible because you can never get rid of the ego it's it's something that we need to learn how to be with and how to work with instead of pushing away or ignore it or or just you know not have it around but i was doing a bit of gardening the other day and and i remembered uh, i kind of thought about this that i think ego is a little bit like weed because there are some weeds that you can just take out and you think you have you are done with it and they will never come back and you go back a couple of days later and you see the same spot it's full of weed, probably the same type of weed, but it's, it's out again. And, and it's something that we continuously need to do reflection. So I always recommend to people in, in Ramadan to do the reflection on a daily basis, if not after every prayer. I, I ideally would recommend that after each prayer, think about what you have done between that prayer and your last prayer. Think about 
where did I let my soul go into the places it shouldn't have gone? What did I do that was not nurturing me? What did I do that was against um, the principles of what I, what you believe and what we believe in Islam and what, what God has uh, given us? Um, because you see that the longer we prolong this and the longer we don't attend our souls, the more layers we will build up. And, and I think one of the things that I love about um, this, this short term but very practical step is that it allows me to make rectify my problems or, or my issues or my, my mistakes between two prayers. Because by the time you get to the end of the day, you want to go to sleep with a clean heart. So these very tiny practical tweaks and adjustments really help you to actually move on and between that prayer and your next prayer, you can be more conscious about how you want to go about it and what you want to do. And the only antithesis for um, working with with the ego is 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 I'm sure there are loads, but I just wanted to bring, which I think is really, really important. And particularly this is the month where we can practice this more than any other time, especially with the corona um, happening. And and I believe that's humility. And humility is is not it's not a false sense of humbleness. Humility is a true sense of being just ourselves as we were created, just being true to who we are, but at the same time, understanding and applying that we are nothing and nobody without the will of Allah. We are really, we have literally no power of anything. If anything, COVID has shown us is that we have literally no power over anything. So humility in practice is again, just like as you work on your ego and as we work on our ego for our, throughout our lifetime, this is what we do with humility too. I, I'm very sensitive to, particularly with, with a bit false sense of humility because I think that's a very um, interesting sign then when of course, these are the things that we, we learn because we are conditioned and we are told what humility should be looking like or how we should practice it or what it should uh, feel like when we are doing it. But I think everybody has to figure out a way of um, who they are and how that humility can really enhance. And, and this is, I say this for the bottom of my heart, I think humility really enhances the quality of a person because humility is this, this softness and the gentleness of the soul that can really put the ego in its place. And, and, and with that thought um, and with the idea of starving egos and nourishing the soul, I, I will finish my reminder. And may Allah accept this from all of us. May Allah make it easy for us to practice. And whatever good I have said, it was from God. And whatever mistake I have made, it was from myself. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Auntie. I really, really enjoyed your talk. Um, I found it really insightful and um, the whole explanation of the three levels of the soul. I, I think that was really, really interesting. Um, I think we should all really try and attain the nurtured and satisfied soul um, this Ramadan. Um, so next uh, we have Usaid Malik, who is 19 years old. He studies medicine at Birmingham University and has completed his HIFS in 2019. His hobbies include playing cricket and watching comedies. So we'll just give everyone um, maybe just a minute if they want to find the surah on their phone to follow. It's surah 64 um, to Haboon. Um, so we'll just give it um, a minute or so. Okay, um, say, would you like to start, please? Thank you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير هو الذي خلقكم فمنكم كافر ومنكم مؤمن والله بما تعملون بصير 
خلق السماوات والأرض بالحق وسوركم فأحسن صوركم وإليه المصير يعلم ما في السماوات والأرض ويعلم ما تسرون وما تعلنون والله عليم بذات الصدور Whatever is in the heavens and on earth does declare the praises and glory of Allah to him belongs dominion, and to him belongs praise, and he has power over all things. It is he who has created you, and of you are some that are unbelievers, and some that are believers, and Allah sees well all that you do. He has created the heavens and the earth in just proportions, and has given you shape, and made your shapes beautiful, and to him is the final goal. He knows what is in the heavens and on earth, and he knows what you conceal and what you reveal. Yea, Allah knows well the secrets of all hearts. Alam yattikum naba'u alladhina kafaru min qablu fadaku wa bala amrihim wa lahum adabun alim. Thalika bi'annahu kanat تيهم رسلهم بالبينات فقالوا أبشر يهدوننا فكفروا وتولوا واستغنى الله والله غني حميد زعم الذين كفروا أن لن يبعثوا قل بلى وربي لتبعثن ثم لتنبؤن بما عملتم وذلك على الله يسير فآمنوا بالله ورسوله والنور الذي أنزلنا والله بما تعملون خبير Has not the story reached you of those who rejected faith aforetime? So they tasted the evil result of their conduct and they had a grievous penalty. That was because there came to them messengers with clear signs, but they said, Shall mere human beings direct us? So they rejected the message and turned away. But Allah can do without them, and Allah is free of all needs, worthy of all praise. The unbelievers think that they will not be raised up for judgment. Say, Yea, by my Lord, you shall, you shall surely be raised up. Then shall you be told the truth of all that you did. And that is easy for Allah. Believe, therefore, in Allah and his messenger, and in the light which we have sent down. And Allah is well acquainted with all that you do. Yawma yajma'ukum li yawmi al-jama'i thalika yawmu al-taghabun wa man yu'min billahi wa ya'mal salihan yukaffir anhu sayyatihi wa yudakhilhu jannatin tajri وَيُدَخِلْهُ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا the day that he assembles you all for a day of assembly, that will be a day of mutual loss and gain among you and those who believe in Allah and work righteousness. He will remove from them their ills and he will admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow to dwell therein forever. That will be the supreme achievement. But those who reject faith and treat our signs as falsehoods, 
They will be companions of the fire, to dwell therein for I, and evil is that goal. ما أصاب من مصيبة إلا بإذن الله ومن يؤمن بالله يهد قلبه والله بكل شيء عليم وأطيع الله وأطيع رسول فإن توليتم فإنما على رسولنا البلاغ المبين الله لا إله إلا هو وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون No kind of calamity can occur except by the leave of Allah and if anyone believes in Allah, Allah guides his heart, for Allah knows all things. So obey Allah and obey his messenger. But if you turn back, the duty of our messenger is but to proclaim the message clearly and openly. Allah, there is no God but, God but he. And Allah, therefore, let the believers put their trust. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوًّا لَكُمْ فَاحْذَرُوهُمْ وَإِنْ تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ أَجْرٌ عَذِيمٌ O oh, you who believe, truly among your wives and your children are some, that are, are some that are enemies to yourselves, so beware of them. But if you forgive and overlook and cover up their faults, verily Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Your riches and your children may be but a trial, but in the presence of Allah is the highest reward. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ وَاسْمَعُوا وَأَطِيعُوا وَأَنْفِقُوا خَيْرًا لِأَنْفُسِكُمْ وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ إِنْ تُقْرِضُوا اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا يُضَاعِفْهُ لَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ شَكُورٌ حَلِيمٌ عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ So fear Allah as much as you can. Listen and obey and spend in charity for the benefit of your own soul and those saved from the covet covetousness of their own souls. They are the ones that achieve prosperity. If you loan to Allah a beautiful loan, he will double it to your credit and he will grant you forgiveness. For Allah is most ready to appreciate service, most forbearing. Knower of what is open, exalted in might, full of wisdom. Thank you so much, Yasaid. That was really lovely recitation, mashallah. <laughs>